Thank you to Kitty, formerly of Kitty Pride fame, uh, for that intro. Um, a little bit of a snippet there from the the great Orion's Belt track from Riff Raff featuring Kitty. Uh, amazing artist, and of course we all know what Riff Raff is like. So if they give you any indication what this episode is going to be about, uh, I decided to take the plunge and do a Taylor Swift episode. Um, this is the intro, so I'm not going to go into the segment yet, but I don't have anything new to discuss about Taylor Swift, but I have my own personal way complaining slash devil's advocating for Taylor Swift, and I think that is well worth the content. Um, past that, since my... Basically, I have a 2013 music podcast episode planned out, but I don't have the supporting material the way I want it yet. So, we're going to just do a sports episode until I get that finished. Because I have it planned out. I have some of it done, but I want to do a whole playlist and um, some other stuff that I'm going to basically get knocked out. So, I'm going to do that next episode, hopefully. Uh, I know it's been about two weeks since the last episode, give or take. I don't really have an excuse. I'm just a lazy son of a bitch. But um, I think it's going to be pretty decent if you like Taylor Swift. Or if you don't like Taylor Swift, it might still be decent. I'm so fucking scared that this thing is going to just beep at me. My uh, feedback protection in GarageBand is... Uh, I don't know how to use this, this button... But it beeped at me before I plugged in my headphones. I'm scared since it blew my fucking eardrums out. Anyway, uh, Taylor Swift episode. Yes. And leading off the Taylor Swift segment too. Just because I know you guys want this that badly. So if you don't know who Taylor Swift is. Uh, 5'10", blonde. Uh, Rust Belt or Southern. One of the two. That's pretty much the same thing. Um... Blue Eyes, literally America's Darling for the last fucking, I don't know how many years. Um, pretty much rose to fame as a country star. And why the fuck am I introducing Taylor Swift? Anyway, um, since uh, 40 year old mom started petering out and Adele stopped doing diamond albums, pretty much Taylor Swift's been the best selling artist in America, more or less. And um, certain cachet that she's gained as this predominant attraction has led to some people um clit riding her even more than they did in the early 2000s which is perfectly fine or late 2000s i guess early 2010s perfectly fine makes uh attractive music to a very large demographic of americans i got no problem with taylor swift fans i really don't i was a kanye stan for a while i didn't have a problem with them then I thought they, I thought the coverage, nationally speaking, media wise, was kind of corny. But Taylor Swift fans, I don't really care about um, one way or the other. With that, with her heiress tour, where I, she did something I actually am a big proponent of uh, in trying to take back your masters. Um, with the heiress tour, that's basically been her using their re-releases to basically market her own music again. Um, billions of dollars generated, as I understand. Uh, her movie is supposed to do 150 million plus, which is her movie is basically a special about her tour, basically kind of Michael Jackson, this is it-esque, um, which I don't want to compare to Michael Jackson, but, you know, that's the premise, you know. And um, with what's come out of that, she's, I'll tell you one thing, people take it however they want to. There's basically nobody in the modern history of music that is more of an opportunist um, when they see a chance to expand their musical exposure to Taylor Swift. Uh, that sounds like a little bit negative, a little bit, uh, you know, uh, slime ballish, I think, implications, but I really mean it as a sincere compliment. Like, there's a ton of people who try to do what Taylor Swift does, but nobody quite like her. Um, and she's dated people for that reason. Many people have done, done that. We saw her. Riff Raff and Katy Perry do this same thing just so Katy Perry can like promote um, a single. It wasn't even a whole album. 
you know, people do this stuff, like, in, in t- entertainment all the time. I think JT and Britney Spears was a thing before I was conscious, aware of the world. Um, it happens. It happens. There's nothing wrong with it. But this latest coupling, uh, her and uh, the great Travis Kelsey, um, a lot of people are, you know, one way or the other. A lot of Taylor Swift fans who don't consume, uh, I guess, sports are now, like, watching the NFL, which I'm a college football f- stan, um, NBA stan, college basketball stan even. Not really a big cut NFL fan. Um, and coincidentally, the NFL uh, just coincidentally had Taylor Swift come out to the Chiefs, who are by far the biggest uh, NFL franchise at this point in terms of exposure right now at this very moment, as the biggest star in the NFL in Patrick Mahomes. And... You have Travis Kelsey. This monolith, relatively speaking, uh, played two of the worst teams in the NFL back-to-back weeks. The New York Jets of Zach Wilson fame and the Chicago Bears of Justin Fields fame. And the biggest star in the country came out of those two games. As you could imagine, the Chiefs won those two games. Now, I'm going to go into a lot of different paths here in this segment. Uh, first, I just want to talk about the NFL's promotion of this. A lot of people are getting pissy about the fact that, like, the NFL is showing her off just about every segue into commercial. Um, some commercials are being shown during a commercial break. Uh, some commercials featuring either Kelsey or, uh, really, Kelsey. I guess Mahomes has a ton of commercials I always get featured, but some people are taking uh, umbrage with the Kelsey ones, even though I saw the Kelsey commercials before Taylor Swift and them were the thing, but, you know, whatever. And um, they're, they're, they're taking umbrage with the amount of exposure there. Um, the NFL earlier today uh, changed multiple social media things to uh, bespoke Taylor Swift and her music or her lyrics or whatever. I don't think a lot of people have... Uh, the capacity to look past it to surface level, which I mean, not to get political, but like you can kind of tell that if you like look at politics for five seconds, most people like are so emotionally charged one way or the other, they can't really look past the surface level for anything. And um, sports are no different, obviously. I mean, Kaepernick, like most people couldn't see Kaepernick play or be on the field without having an emotional reaction. Which signifies a certain level, like, kind of mental incompetence, in my opinion. But I'm not trying to get political here. I'm just, like, making the point that people are typically emotionally charged. If you were emotionally charged, this statement I just made right now, you're proving the point. So don't get mad about that. Um, literally, you can get mad about it, but just don't tell me because you're proving my point. And with Taylor Swift, is no different. Um, some very muscly m- muscle heads uh, took to type on social media. And cried in a fill about changing their Instagram bio to a Taylor Swift caption. Real muscle heads there. Um, as I saw somewhere, I don't have the numbers in front of me. The NFL has 27 million followers and Taylor Swift has 272 million followers. Um, the biggest movie that will be in theaters this year outside of... Barbie and Oppenheimer is going to be the Taylor Swift movie. Uh, I would contend that without knowing anything else that came out this year. Uh, but no, I mean, Killers of the Flower Moon. Uh, there was some Marvel movie that came out this year. Um, even the Marvels. The fucking Flash with um, Predator uh, Miller. All of those are not going to have the same social impact as that damn Eras movie. I, I don't know what it's going to end up being all in all. But if it's projected $150 million as a documentary, that's f- fucking crazy. Fucking crazy. That's 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 meltdown by Drake and t- uh, Travis Scott. Fucking crazy, dude. I don't know what else to say. Um, and that's the number I saw. Some people might see different numbers. I mean, I could look it up real quick, but it might come over. I, and I'll look it up. Uh, we'll just look it up real quick. Um, Taylor Swift. This is going to sound very amateurish. The Eras movie forecast. Look at... Listen to me when I say this shit. 
Movie industry experts predict that Taylor Swift's concert film, which took in 26 million in pre-sales a day, that's a good, that's a lot, the day tickets were announced, could make more than 100 million in its opening weekend, obliterating the total, obliterating the totals for previous top grossing concert films, such as the biggest artist of all time, his last anything musically ever in his fucking life, Michael Jackson's This Is It. And Justin Bieber's, I don't know what I guess purpose would be my guess. I didn't get to see the rest of it because it's just a preview, a snippet of the article. But the point is, that's what Oppenheimer is being predicted to do. No, actually, I think it was Barbie. Hold up, let me see. Uh, Barbie Oppenheimer. I don't know which one it was. I want to say it was it was Barbie. Now that I'm thinking about it. Yeah, Barbie opened 155 million. Uh, Oppenheimer 80 million. So. Basically, it has the same forecast as Barbie, which did a billion. I'm not saying it's going to do a billion, but like this is a concert film that that doesn't happen. That's not supposed to happen. I mean, why the fuck if you have a product that could be connected to this? Why wouldn't you connect it to it? Why wouldn't you? I'm going to tell you right now, that movie is bigger than every NFL regular season game that's ever been played in your lifetime. It's bigger than the fucking Patriots game at the 9-11. It's that big. I would contend it's bigger than every playoff game other than the Super Bowl of your lifetime. The 2001 fucking Raiders against the Patriots. Um, the last Brady-Manning uh, AFC Championship game. It doesn't matter what. I would contend it's bigger than that shit. This is the predominant tour, which used to be stadium tours. used to be like this figurehead of... Of, of music globally, especially in America, though, you know, the fucking Bruce Springsteen's, you know, the fucking Eagles, all these people, Michael Jackson, um, Thriller Tour. But people don't do, people can't do stadium tours anymore, so people don't, like, do them. You know, is a stadium or Let me make sure. Let me make sure. Let me just double check here. I want to say it's, it's stadium, but I might be wrong here. Yeah, stadiums are much larger than right, so Yeah, okay, so yeah, yeah. So yeah, most people can't do a stadium tour. Like, I don't even know the last one that was, like, not a legacy act before fucking Taylor Swift. I'm sure Adele could probably do one. I'm sure she probably did one around the time of the the album with uh, Seth Hardy around, I guess, 21. But outside of her and maybe Beyonce, I think... Did Beyonce do a... I think Brit, Beyonce did that arena. Hold on, let me see. Um, let me see. Is it a stadium or arena? It's a world tour. Um, let me see. It's a world tour. Let me see some of the shows. I can So the thing with, thing with some people is that they do, um, like a mixture of both depending on that area. Let me see. Um, fuck. I don't think it's, I don't think it's a, a stadium. She had very high demand at the time she kept adding shows even the company that owns O2 the range that she could have sold their rent 150 times. Yeah. So basically, um, most of her last tour was arena tour. Okay. I think virtually all of Taylor's was the stadiums, I believe. Don't quote me on that. I don't know that for a fact. Um, the point being, I kind of am beating the horse here at this moment because I'm trying to explain this to NFL people at sports heads. Basically, she's the biggest fucking person on the planet right now, and they fucking capitalize, as any smart business owner would do. Um, in terms of the game, the game fucking sucks. I, I fucking hate the NFL. But even if I didn't hate the NFL, like as a product, just watching it, that first game was fucking terrible. The only reason why you would have watched that game after the first quarter is because you, either you fucking hate fields, which a lot of people do, um, like laugh, laughing the bear, bears, the bears, which a lot of people enjoy doing that. Um, or you just want to watch like, the Chiefs like fucking just rub it in, which I think it was the same weekend as the you know Miami Dolphins, but um, not Buffalo, but Miami Dolphins and Denver game. Where was, you know you kind of wanted to see some more like ass kicking. I get that, but that game was fucking like born, done in the first quarter. I watched. A good chunk of it while I was like kind of playing Spider Man at the same time. And it was just, it was fucking awful. It was just unwatchable. Literally unwatchable. They gave the ball back to him almost every other play. It's fucking terrible shit. The most interesting part of that was the Taylor Swift coverage, by far. 
And the loudest pop the game, not the loudest pop, but on social media, the loudest pop the game got was a touchdown to Cal- Kelsey, where it kind of flashes the fucking Taylor Swift. I wonder fucking why. <laughs> All right, now let me let me try to prognosticate a little bit here because I know some people are gonna like ask when is this stopping? I think they play Minnesota in Minnesota like this week. She's not gonna be there. She's not going to fucking Minnesota. For one, I think the movie is supposed to come out. Let me double check here. I had this pulled up here, didn't I? I think I closed the tab. I'm so unprepared, dude. Um, let me see. Opening day. Uh, October 13th. So she has one more week before. I, I don't know, dude. She was in NY because she lives in NY. I think she had, um, I think it was like her off day or whatever, or like off weekend, a clear weekend. But she, I think she lives in NY. I, I can't see a world where she's in Minnesota, honestly. Um, it's fucking Minnesota for one. The Kansas City one made sense because it's like, it's her going into the like belly of the beast and like becoming a part of it, and then being by the mother, you know, the entire game, doing like the, the homegrown or not homegrown, but like um, down to earth shit, with, like you know, clean up after the fucking place and all that shit. Like it's in the image, right? But it made sense. New York is New York. I mean, and then, you know they brought all the stars. You know, fucking everybody was there. It, that one made sense. Minnesota. No one's going to fucking Minnesota and see fucking Kirk Cousins get fucking... <laughs> see Kirk Cousins fucking go uh, 19 of fucking 29 for 200 and fucking 15 yards and one touchdown is one pick and a fucking like late touchdown drive. It took eight uh, minutes when they needed two touchdowns. They ran out of time. No one wants to see that shit. No one wants to see that damn shit, man. No one, no one's watching that fucking game. Um, I mean, people are gonna watch that game because it's like two talented teams, but like Taylor Swift's not going to fucking game. So if you care about the product alone, she's not gonna make that fucking game. Man. I'll, I'll bet my fucking, I'll bet some chicks fucking clogged arteries. I don't know. I'll bet something like that. I'm not betting anything of value for my own self, but she's not gonna make that fucking game. Will she be at another game? It doesn't make sense to me to do that. The only thing I could think of is if she went to uh, Donna, went with Donna Kelsey to see like Jason Kelsey, who I think still plays for the Eagles. I think, but like, who the fuck do the Eagles play? You know, something, you know so it just doesn't make sense to me. I think this is probably the last weekend she does this shit. Um, the movie comes out next weekend. I think she's got from Virginia. She needs to get out of this. Honestly, I mean, you know, huge scene. Um, you know, kind of a really close game to the very end, Jets and Chiefs. If this makes sense to me. It's kind of a swan song thing here. Um, and, you know, Kelsey obviously has some shout out of it. You know, I, it was a win-win to me. Uh, I don't really have much else to say here. It's just that, to me, I felt like people were not looking at this um, with any kind of, like, level of logical objectivity. It's just emotion. I'm like, oh, my God, I don't want to fucking see a Taylor Swift commercial. I get it. All right, I get the saturation point. But, like, is the game not more fucking interesting with Taylor Swift being there? Like, are we being, if we're just being, like, fair. And again, I, I know I dislike NFL. Like, I, I think it'd be the same to me, like, even if I fucking saw, like, a college football game. Like, it was impressive to me that Colorado was bringing A-list celebrities to college football games. College football games, outside of, like, prime USC, prime Miami, they don't get that type of draw. In NFL... Does they get Taylor Swift? They get like fucking you know like Hugh Jackman, Brian Reynolds. I mean that's they could do that, but they don't get Taylor Swift. You know they don't get fucking you know whoever the fuck they don't get Ronaldo. You know they don't get Messi. Typically speaking, um, they don't get dudes of that caliber. You know maybe LeBron James. I mean he's sports. But here's the thing: it's like you have, you have to separate like massive entertainment celebrities have an entirely different audience. There is no overlap virtually with Taylor Swift's audience to the NFL audience. Broke all types of records. The fucking, um, the Chiefs game and the, the Bears with the female audience, female viewership. Those, they don't have any intersection. It's like 0% damn near. So that's the, that's the, inter, that's the key point. 
not only says a, a massive entertainment person has nothing to do with sports, it's a massive female entertainment person that has nothing to do with sports. Entirely different audience. That's something to keep in mind. And that's about it. I have nothing else to say about this, really. I, I didn't even have this much to say about it. I just kind of read off numbers, and I, I, I can't even impress myself a little bit as I kind of dug into this. But if this is it, um, it was a good two weeks. I enjoyed it. I think if people were, like, not busy, like, fucking dick-eating Zach Wilson against fucking back. And shout out to Zach Wilson for performing, putting the fucking show on when uh, T- Taylor Swift was there. That's a real-ass nigga. Shout out to <laughs> Shout out to Zach Wilson, dude. I'm not going to lie. I said I was going to make this a whole sports pod today. I didn't really want to. to be honest with you. Uh, but if we're going to do it, we're going to commit to it. So you guys are getting the best I have to offer at this point. I keep a lot of topics on hands. I mean, the topics aren't the problem. The problem is if I want to do it or not, which I don't always want to do it. Um, anyway... This isn't really good enough to be a whole topic. I th- I made it, I like had it on my list, but like I can't, I don't think it's good enough to be a whole topic. I personally like, I don't know if anybody else does, I personally love doing like um, entertainer equals athlete comparisons. If you listen to a lot of rap, you'll get them, you know, rap game, Dame Lillard, you know, all that stuff, you know, stuff like that. Um, so I, made, I came up with a few that I liked. And this it really doesn't have, like, you know, it's not good enough to be a whole segment, but uh, Young Keith, Chief Keith, equals D Rose. You can see this on my Twitter, uh, at Chibiscuits, J A Biscuits. Um, Kanye from 808s to Yeezus equals Miami LeBron or first three Pete Michael Jordan. I was proud of that one. Um, Pop Smoke equals Arvita Sabonis. I really like that one. That was a good one. Uh, Takashi says nine equals D'Angelo Russell or D'Lo, pretty accurate one. An Ice Cube equals Akeem Olajuwon. If I was gonna expound it into any of these, um, which I, I mean I can do that real quick. Uh, Chief Keef equals D Rose. Basically, Chief Keef came on hot as fuck in his first few um, seasons or years, and um, kind of just I think on his own kind of uh, secluded himself from you know mainstream relevancy. Uh, still worked fairly well, even though like he ton of projects he never dropped or dropped years later um some that were very hyped such as um thought breaker which came like four years after it was supposed to um but when he was on he was on and uh he had a prime that while short-lived was as impactful as any prime you can find and i mean that just fits d rose to a t i feel like uh, Kanye for AOC Jesus. Basically, I feel like it's roughly his best, to, in my opinion, roughly his best period of time making music. Uh, that'd be from 2007 ish, 2008, really, to about 2013. So, about four or five years. Uh, lines up roughly with, you know, four year Miami, three year Jordan. Um, as far as products go, like actual albums, that'd be 808, uh, Good Fridays, which he, Pretty much as a version of every song on that. My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy, um, Watch the Throne, Cruel Summer, and Caps Off with Yeezus. I believe that is every project there. Not counting any kind of like, you know, Lucy Goosey's that didn't get released or anything like that. But uh, that's roughly his discography there, which is probably the best you're going to see any artist have maybe for the rest of all time. Uh, rap artists at least in terms of a stretch for the rest of all the time maybe any artist period I mean that's that's bona fide like maybe the best rap album post Illmatic um that is the album that many people kind of say put on the crooning like crooning rap sound a lot of people give credit to that 808s for that uh, Yeezus at least made industrial rap like mainstream. I, I don't know if people are, oh, Death Grips. It's like Death Grips. You can probably combine like the top three. I, I, I know I'm like doing a lot of like lip smacking this fucking mic. I don't know what to do. Do I get away from the mic a little bit? Does it make a difference? Can you like, you can still hear, dude, this mic is too fucking good. I don't know what to do with the fucking lip smacking shit. I don't look into it. But basically, you can probably put like the top three singles from Death Grips as a whole as an act and it probably like has less impact than Black Skinhead which is even the biggest song of that album 
So, I mean, like, it's just not, it's just like, if you're talking about just impact, like, Jesus has more impact than all of Death Grips' act, uh, in my opinion. I I may be numerically wrong about it, statistically, I might be off that maybe their top three hits have more numbers than fucking Black Skin I put. Well, I'd be, how how wrong do you think I'll be on that? Not wrong. I don't think I'll be very wrong about that one. Anyway, uh, Pop Smoke, Arvita Sabonis. Arvita Sabonis basically was a Euro legend, uh, kind of came over to. I don't know if y'all heard that. Um, kind of came over to the States at the very end of his kind of playing career. He still had a very high impact because of how talented and how different he was uh, to like kind of conventional centers and stuff. And then Pop Smoke, obviously. Um, I mean, excuse me. Not the first NY drill artist, but I think. Me. I think he was. I think I don't want to know. I don't know if he was the biggest. Let me let me let me look up this NY drill artist. He was definitely the one that I think made it more palatable in England before, um, before him. Let me see. So Fivio Foreign, Two Two GZ, uh, Sleepy Hollow, Chef G, Dusty Lil Kane, um. Okay, so the precursors would be like Bobby Schmurter and Roddy Rebel, you know. So I mean, if that's if that's like drill, drill, like hot nigga, then you know, I mean, he's not better than hot nigga. I'm not even counting anybody that came after he died. Like, I'm not doing that because I mean, obviously, I Spice is bigger than him. I mean, I'm not like debating that, but. I think he was kind of one that was like the more palatable, like the one that kind of like felt. It might be in in part because Bobby got arrested soon after he, you know, kind of got on. But I think he was that dude. And I think he made a lot of headwind before he really blew up um, with Dior and all those tracks. And he died. He died died prematurely. um, Kind of before he could really be the best pop smoke. Unfortunately, so that was that was sad, but that's that's kind of where the comparison came from. Uh, Takashi says nine equals D Lo. Come on, man. Ice Cube equals Hakeem Olajuwon. Basically, I think Ice Cube has like two or three like albums that like legit classics and nobody talks about. Uh, America's Most Wanted Death Certificate, uh, classic project. Hakeem has two. Um, I think some people look at Ice Cube kind of like the veil of like he's number one or two to some other like in wide or not in wide. Um, Cali Dusa came up around that time. Uh, in impact, I, I I think in in like name. If you look back, I feel like he gets trapped under Easy and and Dre. It's kind of because Easy died, and then Dre was just like bigger. Like I mean, the the chronic is I I would have probably put money as bigger than either those two albums I just mentioned. Although they both are platinum plus, as I understand, but. I think they're both double platinum plus, but uh, the Chronic has. <laughs> Too low to that is acting crazy. That for all is a label that pays me. Uh, Fade of both of them. Uh, anyway, um, so yeah, that's 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 a hell of a single. Also, Let Me Rise up a popular one. You can fuck with Dre Day, the Easy E does. I mean, that's a good one, too. It's tough, right? It's tough. Like, it's tough. That's, if you have one of those type singles, you're going to sell for the rest of the whole time. Like, you're never going to see the Chronic not sell because of that fucking single. So, there's that. But, um, that was the comparison. I also did one more because, literally, like, I was doing these, the Dame Miller trade broke. And uh, I did one more because I was like, what the fuck? And I did Jimmy Butler because Kodak Black. I, I did that one because I felt like Kodak Black should have been a megastar, like a face of the league based off of just his own entertainment value. And when he puts out their own albums, he passed quality albums. I mean, I thought, you know, you, you I mean, if you look back to painting pictures, probably should have been a start of like a, a mainstream like run. Uh, I mean, multiple songs that were huge. Uh, right now I gotta keep a tunnel vision um, you know patty cake I mean just some fucking like, seminal songs in that, that time period of, of rap 
And even though, I mean, I thought 2018's, um, the one with ZZ and all those, it's, it's the one where he has, like, the heart on it or whatever. God, I gotta, I gotta look it up real quick. It's almost like saying some shit, dude. I don't know what to say. What is that? Someone's singing. Uh, Dying to Live by Kodak. Anyway, uh, that one had... Uh, uh, Wake Up in the Sky, was that on that? Pippin' It Easy, I think that was on there. Um, had the Estes and Tassi on song off of there, too. Th- you think a, a run would have happened there, but because of his own like idiocy and shit like that, it just kind of never happened. Um, if I'm lying, I'm flying. Calling my spirit. Like It was just mosh pit. It was just kind of crazy like that. That one never... Um, Never kind of led to more success. Uh, I like to saw gnarly also. I mean, it's just crazy. Like, he never really um, captured me again. So I can't really say, like, he never was, like, big again. But, like, even if you look at his Twitter, like, no flocking, painting pictures, dying to live. And that's the last album they mentioned for a while. They mentioned his legal issues. Then they go on to mention his third studio album, Build Israel. Then, um, you know, back for everything. But he he had a moment, man. He just did not capitalize on it from what I can... Well, you can really gather just looking at his stuff. He didn't really capture uh, the success that probably should have been there. Even Project Baby 2, which had, um, I think, Versatile 2 on it. That was a big one. Um, Project... Was it Project Baby 1 that had that song on it? Rolling Beast? I don't know. Let me see. Okay, I type in the fucking song. Apparently, one of his biggest songs. Fucking can't even find it on Twitter. Or Wikipedia. Anyway, um... Yeah, he was in his bag, man. You gotta... You gotta give that man his props. And Kodak... I mean, Jimmy Butler, obviously. Like, I think that fits well. Jimmy Butler probably should have been a superstar at some point. You know, we just consider, like, what he accomplished. It wasn't Project Baby 2, that song. Um... It, it's just... It's just crazy to me, like, that, that never kind of... The, the 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 ring never came along after a certain point like that Chicago team that lost to LeBron in the game winner, um, that team probably was deeper than a Cleveland squad, but you know they just didn't have enough to keep up with LeBron. That was the last really good Cleveland squad was the Rose era. Um, Timberwolves years, I mean, like Jimmy did in the media day today, you kind of skip up the Timberwolves years, even though like if you look back like Jimmy Wiggins Levine. And towns, like that amounting to nothing is kind of crazy to look back at. Uh, and Jeff T as well, I believe. But you know, it is what it is. Um, and then I think Levine. I don't know if Levine and Jimmy ever played together because I think Levine was traded for Jimmy. I think. But anyway, um, the Philly years. I mean, the Philly one. That, that one year not ending in the championship is kind of crazy looking back. I mean, you had Jimmy and B. Reddick, Simmons. Yeah, you had the big four. And then Fultz was on that team as well. And, I mean, you get nothing out of that. Tobias, I forgot about Tobias. You get nothing out of that either. I mean, good grief. And um, these Miami years been so fucking close, dude. But just so far, I mean, the the bubble run, incredible. But I think Harrell got hurt. I think Bam might have got hurt too. I think his whole team got a fucking hurt in that. Drogic was out for multiple games. Um... Even uh, none was out for most of the season, the series, as I recall, or at least half of it, I think. Um, and then the next one, I mean, you had fucking Sis 8 Bam and 155 year old fucking Cody Zeller against Nikola fucking Jokic. I mean, what are, what are you gonna do? Um, I made this segment a lot less, a lot longer than I thought I would. Uh, let's talk about the SEC. Let's talk about the SEC. I'm just gonna let it go, we'll just keep on letting it roll. Um, SEC fucking sucks. I don't know if anybody else has said that yet to you guys. I don't know if you've heard that from anybody else. I'm telling it to you right now. The SEC is fucking terrible. I'm an Auburn fan. I've watched a ton of SEC football. SEC fucking sucks, dude. I, I don't know if it's the worst conference. I, I actually, actually, I know it's not. The Big 12 is the worst conference. But, like, I think you can make the argument is third. I mean, can you? I think. Maryland, Ohio State. Michigan, Penn State, 
Let me let me pull. I have the SEC pool. Let me pull the Big Ten real quick. The Pac-12 is obviously like pre-dominant. I'm not even like anybody who's like arguing with you about like SEC versus fucking Pac-12. Just block them. Don't even listen to. I don't care if it's your mama. Just block them, dude. There's there's not an argument to be made at this point. That's just somebody who like doesn't watch any other team. I do my best. Like I don't watch fucking Iowa against Rutgers. Like I'm not gonna pretend like I, I do that shit. But like. At this point, like, you're not watching even the big Big Ten games. You've like come to that conclusion that fucking fucking the SEC, this fucking Pac-12, dude. Like it's just it's not even funny, dude. Anyway, let's look up the Big Ten. All right, so Penn State. Uh, this is the East, which I think I thought the divisions just got scrapped. But anyway, um, Penn State, Maryland, Michigan, Ohio State, all four and zero. Rutgers' only loss was, I believe, 34-7 to against Michigan, where it was semi-close for like a quarter and a half. Uh, Wisconsin, 3-1. Minnesota, 3-2. and two, Purdue, 2-3. Two and three, Iowa, 4-1. and one. Iowa's defense could probably win against a lot of teams, but fucking their offense, dude. Brian Ferris, man. Um, Wisconsin, they lost a struggle game against somebody. They lost against Washington State, who's 13th. I mean... It's not nothing, you know. Like that's something. I mean, the, you can make the argument. Like, can you make the argument? There's four fucking like good teams in the SEC right now. I'm gonna look at the SEC real quick. It, it's not easy to do this. Alabama four and one got ass kicked by fucking uh, both Texas and South Florida's defense. A uh, and M four and one got their ass kicked against Miami. Um, and they their recovery has been beaten up, hapless about the farther head coach for Arkansas, and Auburn who fucking can't throw for hundred yards against anybody with a pulse. Uh, LSU is already the season already over with. Lost to Ole Miss and gave up fifty sits I think in that game. And then they got their ass kicked against Florida State. Uh, Ole Miss who who I, I promise you Ole Miss will have lost Tulane and Michael Pratt played. I promise you that shit. Michael Pratt is such a jump over the true freshman they played in that damn game. I promise you Ole Miss loses that game if, if he plays. Also gave up, only scored 10 points against Alabama when Texas put up 34. Um, Lane Kiffin, offensive girl, 3-2 uh, and two, Auburn. Should probably be 2-3. and three. Um, Almost beat Georgia. Almost beat Georgia. Uh, Georgia, who struggled uh, for a half, maybe three quarters against South Carolina, who got there, I kicked this UNC. Um, Kentucky, who uh, them and Missouri are probably only real competitors to Georgia in the SEC East. Tennessee is just not it this year. It's just not. Um, they have a good record, but they're not. Yeah. Can you do four good teams in SEC? Yeah. I mean, I could say Alabama's good. LSU's probably good. Like, they're competitive, you know, but, like, I don't even know. I, can say. I mean, I'm saying, if you're calling Maryland good, I'm saying, like, LSU's good. LSU would beat Maryland, probably. Um, past that, dude, I don't know. Like, Mississippi is probably good like Tulane isn't bad it's not even like a bad loss but like I just say they would have lost if, if Michael Pratt played uh so you Mississippi I, I give you Alabama LSU uh, Ole Miss healthy with the receivers back yeah. um Kentucky Georgia and Missouri has a win against a, like a top 15 Kansas State. So, I mean, that's not nothing. So maybe six teams if I was like kind of really like, you know, looking at it, which is, I mean, that's probably more than a Big Ten has. But like, I don't even know. Like Iowa is a deadly matchup against like half the team I just listed. Iowa against Kentucky or Missouri, they're snuffing those motherfuckers. Like Luther Burden is crazy for Missouri, but like Iowa is snuffing like Kentucky or Missouri off rip. If you don't really have, if you don't have like a real talent advantage against Iowa, and it's just scheme against scheme, they're snuffing most fucking teams out. Um, I, I, like even the, the like Georgia isn't that good this year. They're not like bad. They're still top three bare minimum, but they're not like Georgia. I, I, it's not like last year they slept on. Last year they would turn it on against teams they needed to turn it on. They played against Auburn after having slept on after a few games even before and after that Auburn game. And they just, like, shut Auburn down from a depth and talent perspective. They couldn't do that this game. They they couldn't. They couldn't turn it on. There was no turn on. They just basically got to a point where Auburn couldn't play press on Brock Bowers anymore. They couldn't blitz anymore. 
And with only four rushing and zone against Bowers, they just threw to the open guy that's better than everybody else on the field. But outside of that, they had no answers. A lot of those heroic throws Bowers made was on second and third downs. Like, you, we need to get these or like the drive is fucked type downs. It, it wasn't a clean Georgia win by any means. Like, I mean, and this Auburn, I think Auburn secondary is stellar when healthy and all starters are out there, but the depth is not there. And the game opened up for Georgia when Jalen Simpson got hurt. Before then, I mean, the passing game was fucking, I mean, forget about it, you know. Um, so, I mean, there's that. I think ACC is probably number two, I mean, realistically speaking. But, dude, I, how, how many Pac-12 teams do you think can beat up, like, Alabama? I think there's three at the least. Like, I don't mean beat up and, like, blow out, but, like, put some real points on those dudes. Um, Washington, in my, in my opinion, easy. Oregon, depends on the pass rush, but I'm going to go yes. Um, I, I, listen, man. Some people, some people don't want to hear it, man. Colorado, dude. It, it just depends on the pass rush. It just depends on the pass rush. I'm not saying they're number three in that equation, but it just depends on the pass rush. To me, is USC is going to do their thing against Alabama, but how much of their thing is capped by, like, pretty much their game script. Like, they don't run the ball enough to account for how bad their defense is. They Riley has this problem where he just, like, loves the fucking big play. Like, fucking dick in his throat, big play, pause. He just sucks that shit off. And his defense is so fucking bad. They need, like, a burn the clock down for six, seven minutes type drives, and he just won't give it to him because he wants a fucking 50 minute. It's just some shit that he does. I mean, it's just some shit he does. Um, There's other coaches like that that just love a good passing game and like the long touchdowns, even though it kills their defense. It happens, but they need they need some pace. And uh, he won't give it to them. They, the defense is killed by the fucking second half. And uh, they basically won because there wasn't enough clock left for the fucking game against Colorado. They could have lost Arizona State game. They, they're just not, they don't got it. They don't really got it like that, in my opinion. Uh, Washington State could give Cam Moore, do he? Cam Moore's a problem. I like I like the top half, the Pac-12, man. The back half, man. But it's better than it's been a lot of times. Arizona was competitive in some games. Arizona State was competitive in some games. Colorado, I guess, is now close to the, the back half at this point. I think they lost two straight Pac-12 teams or games. So if that's like your sixth or seventh best team, Colorado, that's pretty fucking good. Colorado's scheme offensively is going to get a lot of fucking teams. I mean, you got a lot of teams already. But um, that's the SEC. Um, can we do an early episode? I don't know. I feel like Taylor Swift one was so good. Like I just, I think making this one like an hour episode feels like it's just, it's just not. Not 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 good. You know, it's not good. That's some more some more topics, but we're gonna really like knock out the park of twenty thirteen when I hope. So we just end this one here. Um recommendations. Oh yeah, let me well oh, fuck it. We'll just we'll just keep on going. Uh so for my recommendations, I'm going to provide uh George Clanton is Justify Your Life. I've been young, you hold the key. Uh, these are a couple of singles off the album. Uh ooh rap I uh which is the worst, worst album name of all time. Uh, Ooh Rap I Yai is kind of a vaporwave adjacent album, kind of, you know, kind of, it's kind of, I know it's like a derogatory for some people to call it that, but kind of, um, maybe Chill Wave, I don't know, but Justify Your Life, great single, uh, I've Been Young, good track, and You Hold the Key. Um, Bloodbath 64, uh, Aesthetic uh, Delica, uh, this is basically a side project of TV girl who does a lot of kind of like, um, I mean, this album is like Vaporwave adjacent, but I don't know what to call like TV girl. I don't know what, how to put them in a box. Like dream popish, stargazy kind of shit. Really, some really good shit out of TV girl in general. Like I, the one that they have with Jordana, I'd recommend listening to that. This project has, um, the vaporwave parts, like they're just uh, kind of sonically unmoving, uh, just instrumental tracks, kind of boring to me, honestly. But the one that are more vocal based, 
are fun to me, like uh, Beautiful Horses, um, Vapor Season, and there's another one I'm forgetting right now. Uh, the magazine songs are pretty cool. I mean, they're kind of more vaporwave-ish, but I thought they were cool, too. We got so much shit happening today. I don't know if you hear any of this shit. Fucking cops just shooting niggas up outside. Um, and finally, the 2023 Yeji album. I don't know the name of it. I just threw it on when I was at work. And I think Yeji's always like vocally interesting. Um, production usually pretty tight. And this album is uh, also pretty tight. Um, shout out to Yeji. Shout out to Yeji. I don't know what the fuck she says some of the time, but... You know, you gotta like her. She's the bone with Yeji. She's like, she's like 50. She looks like young and old at the same time. It's, it's tough, dude. It's tough. Like, I'm not making fun of her by, by any means. It's just like, I think that's why she hasn't like blown. Which I mean, Rain Girl did pretty well, but like, I just don't know if she has like the look to blow. And I know like that sounds like I'm being derogatory. Like, I, I would say that about like a lot of male artists too. Like, there's like Alice Cameron is a good male artist that like will never be a mainstream success just because like he doesn't look the part i'm not like saying she's ugly or anything like that i'm just saying like she literally doesn't look and we think of i don't know why i'm explaining myself i'm just saying she doesn't like look like a star you know but she makes good music which is all that matters i think the same thing kind of applies to like alice cameron who like makes shit that will never be like <laughs> mainstream but he he makes good music just the dish is not meant to be mainstream whatsoever anyway show the yeji um pretty interesting artist i would say all things considered um i don't know if i listened to the entire project by her since the fucking uh the one with rain girl on in 2017 and this is the one i listened to the most since then so um yeah shout out shout out yeji um vocally impressive artist uh, that's gonna be, I think, about it. Let's call it a day. I don't have anything else to recommend at this point, so recommend it. Um, if you haven't watched Bleach yet, go fucking watch Bleach, dude. I fucking, I'm a manga watcher, or I'm a manga reader by trade, but I fucking watched the entire Bleach anime, which I watched it without filler. <laughs> but, uh, I've read the TYBW art, and they go a whole different fucking direction, like the last few episodes of that shit. You can watch the last few episodes with like your manga friend, your manga stand for Bleach, and they will have virtually no like idea of what's happening at a certain point in those last two episodes, especially the last episode. Almost the entire last episode is like anime only shit, which is impressive, honestly. Uh, that's gonna be about it. Uh, Bleach, Yag, Taylor Swift, Five Ten, legs like a fucking stallion. Um, can you imagine a thick Taylor Swift? Like, I'm not gonna go in the horny mode here, but like, there's some power that a thick Taylor Swift would have that I don't think niggas are compared for really. 